All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is December 26, 2021. And as you could see here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, it is freezing. It is minus 28 Celsius for you American brothers and sisters. That's like minus 16, minus 17 Fahrenheit. It's freezing. <laughs> I've been in the garage. Uh, you know, my little sanctuary I have set up in the garage. And uh, I have my little Mr. Heater here, man. It's been going for oh, probably close to an hour and a half, two hours now. And I was putting some things together and debating how far I want to go into this. And I'm just not so sure on this second piece and things that some brothers and sisters were sharing. And so I'm, <laughs> and while doing all that, I'm I'm waiting for it to get warmer and warmer. Uh, I've got it on full blast, like a foot and a half away from me. So, excuse me. So it's uh, it'll maintain its heat for me. You see, that's because I love you, brothers and sisters. I love the Lord, and I love doing what I do. So, regardless, in the heat or in the cold, I will continue to do what I do. And so, with that, today I wanted to share something really interesting. Um. And it has to do with the 12 days of Christmas. We had a sister uh, over in the forum. I'll talk about that in a moment for new people. Uh, but we had a sister over in the forum share this link. This is a great picture, by the way. Uh, share this link about the 12 days of Christmas. Now, for me, it wasn't so much that Didi had shared. Uh, uh, um, uh, what do I want to say? That I appreciated that she shared it, but it wasn't that... You know, what might the insight be to these 12 days? But as soon as I read that post, I had an instant flash in my mind. And I went to go look at something that we here in this ministry have looked at a number of times. And we know is in the count time frame. So we're going to spend some time looking at that today. And what had happened is... Based on some other information we were looking at and where some other brothers and sisters are looking uh, in relation to Luke chapter 1 and, and John uh, uh, about the sixth month. And lo and behold, I was looking into this um, last, last, yeah, yesterday, last night, later at night, I was looking up info on this sixth month. Could it be the sixth month of the year or was it just referring to the sixth month of her pregnancy? And so I do a little clicking to see what I could find about the sixth month. And I find this website and this guy's talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. You're going to see something amazing now. <laughs> he It had nothing to do. What I ended up looking at had nothing to do with this whole thing about the sixth month. And it led me to something else that I believe confirmed even more of probably what the title of this video is, which is the stone's throw, all right, or stone's throw. I'm going to go into some of this detail with you and show you where it led me. And what I was hesitating on still showing is what... um. Our, one of our, our brother Ivan had shared about this whole six month thing. And I was really going back and forth with it with my wife and, and, and just, you know, sounding it off as I do. And so much of it sounded so good, but I had some issues and I still have some, some big unanswerable questions within it that must be a part of it. And so I might touch on it and let you guys know those things, but, um, my main focus is this 12 days of Christmas and, and, and the excitement of this still being in this hunt that we're, that we're looking to be a part of. But I'll show you why throughout as we're going, why there's these points that look really good, but then all of a sudden you see the other side and the other side points to the other portion that's about six months later. And you're like, come on, <laughs> why isn't there just one place where there's all in the vicinity, maybe within a month, but no, you'll have two within the same month and then you'll have two more within the same month, but 
they're six months apart. You'll see what I'm talking about. It drives me crazy. So maybe we'll be able to have clues in other parts and and that will help us and 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 maybe build on this season and time that we're still in. Okay? So we're going to talk about those things and we're going to just keep digging and digging. And when it comes to the next video, guys, um, I, I expect, you know, God willing that the next one I do is going to be about the, um, uh, uh, there had been a number of questions lately. I, I went through it briefly over with uh, Mike on one on uh, Interrupts 165 about a week or two ago. And it's about the son of perdition. I'm going to do a full reveal, a full breakdown from the time we're in in this Laodicean church to this future time of the Laodicean church. And I'm going to break down all the scriptures for it. It's going to be really, really exciting. And having said that, for anybody that's new to this ministry, before you watch a video like that, that's going to be coming up next, if you don't understand the foundations here in this video, it's called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. This series will blow your mind. But the most important part is video one and video two, okay? This is the first revelation, the first key this ministry was given in September 2017. It's the revelation to finally, once and for all, understand who the Gospels are speaking to. All of our lives, we've been taught from the Gospel of Matthew and thinking that Mark and Luke and the Synoptic Gospels are just another perspective. And maybe that was a way to look at it in the, in the times we're living in. But there's been a revelation that is, has shown us why there are so many differences within the Gospels of the same stories that people have often, often called contradictions. They would clearly be contradictions if you didn't know what's revealed in this video that I'm talking about right here. It's just an intro. It's 30 minutes long. You can come and print out the document that I read from. You can come and print it out here for the study note series. It's only six pages. And you're going to see for the first time in your life, if you're new, that Luke. So what was Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end days is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Okay? Matthew is speaking to the Jews. That's nothing new. But yet we've all been taught from the gospel of Matthew. And everything else is just is, is, is other points of view in Mark and, Math, in Mark and Luke and even some in John. But 90% of everything we've been taught in church comes from a foundational point of looking from the perspective of Matthew. And that is what has caused us to miss more than half the story. Because it was never understood who Mark was speaking to. Mark is speaking to the house of Israel, the sleeping church that's grafted in with them. Okay, And Luke is speaking to the bride of Christ. These are the three groups. Luke's group, the bride of Christ, goes pre-trib. Mark's group goes after the seals, after the sixth year of seals. In the seventh year of seals is when the rapture of the great multitude sleeping church goes. And then Matthew is at the end of six years of trumpets when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives and deals with Satan and all the enemies that came against Jerusalem in that final year. Now you're going to say, wait a second. What's he talking about seven years and seven years? That's right. Then you'll start to understand in this second video, this second intro uh, video about the end time years. And you're going to find out that because we've been taught from Matthew all, all of our lives, we see that it's only seven years of Jacob's trouble, seven years for Judah. But that's because everything we've been taught is from the perspective of Matthew. So it's as if you're at the end of Mark looking at Matthew and saying it's for the Jews. But yet you're at the end of Mark which is the end of seals, because we haven't been taught, we, hadn't been realized, we haven't realized, the church hadn't realized that Mark is speaking to a specific group. If they did, they would have been teaching from Mark instead of Matthew for hundreds of years. But better than that, there's another group, which is Luke's group. And you're going to understand it in these videos. The 14 years, it is seven years of seals for the sleeping church. And in that seventh year of seals, it'll be the great multitude rapture. And then it'll be the time of Jacob's trouble. Then it'll be Matthew's seven years of trumpets. 
And then the Lord returns in that seventh year, feet down on the Mount of Olives. But Luke's group goes prior to a 40, 50 day period of time before the 14 years begins. You'll start to understand that in these videos, and it is awesome. It'll explode your mind with all these questions you had had. How could this be? How could that be? How could they be burning weapons for seven years in Ezekiel chapter 39 if they just started war in chapter 39? You see, how could there be no weapons during the seven years of tribulation? Doesn't make sense, right? That's because that's at the end of seals. It's it's amazing when you understand it. And so when you understand that, it really, really excites you. You start to, to realize things and put together things as you never have before. And that's what we've been doing here for the last four years. And once you take the time there, you can always go into the third video, The Differences and the Truth, and it talks about these differences and how it wasn't understood. So, and the reason being is because we've all been taught from Matthew. And this is an end time ministry. This is a ministry in the revelation of the opening of the books for the end of days. And the focus is the end of days that are coming. But as it's revealed the end of days, it also brings clarity to things that we're currently in from the time of Christ and to the things of the Old Testament and brings greater and greater clarity. It is fantastic. I promise you it'll be worth every moment of your time and you're going to get so excited because you're going to be able to dig into Scripture and you're going to get so passionate about it because you're going to remember things that have caused you questions and caused you to scratch your heads and now you're going to start to understand them. And what you may have just heard me say as well is you might want to come and watch the sixth video. Because you're going to realize that all these debates, all of this infighting, all of these things that have, that have been debated over the years about whether pre-trib is true, whether mid-trib is true, whether post-trib is true, you're going to find out for the first time in your life the reason why everybody can support, everybody can back up with Scripture, their point of view, is because they're all true. It is the pre-trib bride of Christ that escapes first. It is the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. And it is the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, the seventh year of trumpets. At the end of 13, he returns and he fulfills the 14th year. That is the revelation. That is the big picture. It's 50 days count. A 14 years, and when the 14 years are over, it's the Jubilee, the final Jubilee. All right? It is so exciting, guys. I'm telling you, when you see it, when you understand it, you'll never, ever look at Scripture the same because it'll all start to make much more sense. You know, it's it's this whole thing when I, in the pre-mid post. Here's the best way to show you guys. 2 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 2. Paul says, I knew a man. Remember, it's types and shadows, okay? Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. So there's a period of time more than 14 years ago. This ministry, we've, we've got the revelation. It's 50 days, okay? And he says, above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, such as one. This word means like, okay? Somebody such as one, like a harpazo, like a rapture, not the rapture, but like a rapture. And where does this group go? To the third heaven. And then he says, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, how that he was caught up. This is like a rapture. This one is the rapture. And this rapture group goes to paradise. So what do we have? We have one group taken. We have a second group taken in the type and shadow. That's a pre-trib escape, like a rapture. We call it, I call it the escape. And we do that because of Luke 21, verse 36. So we have a like a rapture. We have the rapture. So two groups being taken. And then he says, the third time I am ready to come to you. He's talking to Judah. Now he's coming the third time. So it's a taking, a taking, and a return. That's the revelation. It's the pre, mid, and post 
right here in front of our eyes the whole time in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But it could never have been understood without first understanding the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. John speaks to a worker group, okay, like the 144 and other workers, but in particular, there's a strong focus in John's 144 that start from chapter 15 and go into uh, when he leaves and so forth. We'll, we'll talk about that in uh, this upcoming video. But John is, is to this worker group, all right? And in his chapters, you'll notice there's 21 chapters. It's because it's like the seven years coming to the end for the bride. And then you've got the eighth starting right at the beginning of the 14 years. And then what? Then you got the rapture. They're going to go to paradise, the place that Jesus went to prepare for them, just like he says here. And then what? Then he's going to be cut off and he's going to return again after 20 years. And that's what we got here. This resurrection story when he says that he must rise again from the dead and he shows up again to them. It's fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And if you take the time to watch those intros, it truly will blow you away. All right. Um, you will have also heard me say uh, the, the, the forum. So for anybody who wants to join the forum, you can go to our website right here at ministryrevealed.com. Top right hand corner, you click on the menu and you could sign up to the forum. It'll just take you a few minutes. We've got 900 people in here now sharing all sorts of things from news to, to studies to, to all sorts of things going on in there. All right. So let's keep going from there. And I wanted to share with you guys, like I said, it was this, this, this instant thought that as soon as I saw this post by Didi about the 12 days of Christmas, it hit me like a ton of bricks because all my life, it just never dawned on me. You know, some things you hear things and you just, you, you just don't think about it. You know, okay, whatever. I've heard about the 12 days of Christmas many times throughout my life, of course, just like so many of you. But, oh my goodness, look at that, minus 31 now. Keep going, Peter, keep going. <laughs> it's getting worse. So, <laughs> at least my breath, I'm not seeing it so much now. Anyways, so I had heard it like many of you guys, you know, the 12 days of Christmas, but what had never dawned on me is when you count the 12 days of Christmas. I always thought the 12 days of Christmas started before Christmas and the 12th day it ended at Christmas. It wasn't until this article that I realized the 12 days of Christmas started at Christmas. And I couldn't for the life of me, why would it be after Christmas? It's already Christmas. Why am I, why are there 12 things, you know, or 11 more things after Christmas? So it was, it was really making me scratch my head, but I instantly, like I said, had something hit me in my thoughts and it had nothing to do with what those 12 things of Christmas represented, but it reminded me of some scripture that we have talked about here in this ministry a number of times, and even recently. If you remember this video, I've talked about it recently, called Chapter 7, Chapter 8. It's in the books, okay? And what this was about was this revelation. For those that are new, you're going to say, what is he talking about? You're going to understand that we have this chart here called the chapters to years. And what this is, is the books of Hosea, Zechariah, John, Acts, Ezekiel, Psalms, Genesis, Hebrews, Exodus, Judges. All of these books of the Bible have opened to us, revealing to us the types and shadows within them, that within their chapters, there are events that relate to the coming end of days. It is fascinating, all right? I know it would be hard to take in at first if you're just beginning to listen. There's a lot of things that are hard to take in. But you realize these that there's these chapters to years, okay? And when we've taught on these things, oh, when we've taught on these things about the seven and eight, we were talking about how John chapter 7, remember how I just showed, you know, the, the typology of the, the 21 years and the 20 and at the 14th year and the 7th year and all that stuff? Well, in John chapter 7, going into chapter 8 is some 
is some information for us to, to be able to discern this period of time that's about to take place for the escape of the bride, at the timing of the escape of the bride. And John, uh, sorry, and Genesis chapter 7 to 8 is very similar, but not exactly the same, but similar in the sense, let me show you, similar in the sense that Genesis chapter 1 through 21 has opened to us just like John 1 to John 21 has. There are typologies and types and shadows directly related to events in the end of days, in those years of those chapters. It's really quite freaky. So here we are. This is like what, whatever year, whether it's this year and we're in it right now, or whether it's soon approaching, this seventh year right here is actually going to be the true 70th year recognized by God since they, be, they, since they came into the land. And we've shared on this many times. It has to do with Leviticus um, uh, chapter 19. So it's either coming up now or it might be a little bit longer, but not by much. All right. But this seventh year, when the end of the seventh year comes to place, right as it's coming towards the end of it, it would be the time of the escape of the bride. And then the 40 days of the Son of Man within the 50, there's the 40 days of the Son of Man. And then it's the time of the 14 years after those, this, what we call Holy Ghost 2.0. Well, what do we see here in Genesis? We see them get in the ark. And when they get in the ark, the Lord shuts them in and 40 days begin. Well, that's what we've been teaching. There's 40 days of the Son of Man that's going to take place after the escape of the bride. You come to chapter 8 and look at what we see. 40 days come to an end. The raven, the Antichrist spirit goes out and then the Holy Ghost goes out. And what do you see? Then seven days as years, seven days as years. We've talked about this here many times. So you've got this chapter seven going into eight, which deals with this escape of the bride within the seventh and then into the eighth, the start time frame of the 14 years. We've showed this in, in many situations. And in John chapter seven, here's another one. <clears throat> again, we're talking about what was talked about in this video over a year ago. And when we come into John chapter 7, we see that it was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. I believe it relates to Hanukkah. So either we're past Hanukkah, and this is another year to go, or that Hanukkah really wasn't you know, on this lunar calendar where they move it and they're adding a month and subtracting a month every once in a while or, or adding a month and then not adding a month. So is it that there's another month added or is it possible that the 25th of Kislev was chosen because of this timing that it was when Christ was born at the 25th of December? You know, and a lot of people like to throw up a stink about it and I used to do the same. But I've studied way more than, than I did when I was back then and saying all this Saturnalia stuff. You see, sometimes these things are covered up by these things. Sometimes the enemy is attacking these periods of time to throw this wrench in to make everybody question everything. Okay? Is it bad to question? Absolutely not. I promise you, this is why I have come to understand what I do. Because... I questioned a lot of things and just said, Lord, like, why would this be like? I've questioned all my life. But once I get the answer, once I know that I have understood it, I don't have to keep questioning it. Now, am I saying that about Christmas? No, I'm talking about the Gospels and the revelation of the Gospels and the 14 years and the big picture and the 21 and all of that stuff. But this peace with Christ and his birth, it's still causing us to scratch our heads because we thought it would have happened at the, at the Hanukkah relating to lights. So is it possible with this connection to Christmas? Well, this is the thing that we're talking about right now. And so if we look at this, and this relates to Hanukkah, okay, as, you know, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, not the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles, not the Feast of Tabernacles, but the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, which relates to a second tabernacles, which is what Hanukkah was, is, okay? So what I'm proposing possible 
is that it actually was in line at the time with Christ's birth of December 25th. But because the Hebrew calendar moves because of the moon, it's not always stable at the time of the sun. And we've recently spoken about this with the sun, that Jesus is the sun, right? He is the S-U-N, just like we read in uh, Malachi 4, or 1-4, or 4. We read that he is the S-U-N. So it started making me question and say, well, wait a second. I wonder if this whole 365-day thing is maybe the way we're to look at this period of time. We're not in the Judah time frame. We're in the period of the world. And the world works on a Gregorian calendar. And it seems, I know it seems kind of ridiculous because you would say, well, we know the year doesn't even start in January. That's where Rome moved it. Okay, it's only been, what, 500 years or something like that. Right? That, that's where April Fool's comes from. Okay, in French, it was Poisson d'Avril. We talked about that uh, a couple of years ago. And a year before that. It's, it's pretty wild to understand. It was, I think it was a little over 400 years ago. And it had to do when they switched spring for the new year. And they made it, the, you know, during winter. It was the craziest thing. And they would put little fish cutouts and, and make fun of people in the countryside that hadn't switched to this new year in winter. So it seems like an odd thing to think that maybe the Lord, understanding that this would be the period of time that we were in, would adjust it, or not adjust it, but had already planned and worked it out on that time frame. I know it seems weird. Okay, I know it seems kind of awkward, but let's not forget this whole thing with Malachi about t saying that Jesus is the sun, okay? As the sun, as that bright light, okay? As we read, as we read and read in Psalms 19, when it says, Their line has gone throughout, throughout all the world, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoicing as a strong man, ready to run a race. So this is referencing the son coming from his tabernacle as the bridegroom. So again, a reference to Christ as the son. So is it possible that this cycle relating with him as the son and, and this timing that we're in, you're going to see why, why I'm, 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 throwing this out there and and bringing reference to this okay so here's this what i believe is not just not feast of tabernacles but the jews feast of tabernacles as hanukkah we know that then there's a seventh day and then you get this really weird thing at the end of it and this has been something debated by people all over the place, all over the world, theologians everywhere, there's books about it. And it's this whole thing from John chapter 7, the last verse, where it's the heading, where it's the beginning of this, uh, the woman caught in adultery, and it says, and every man went to his own house. Then you come to chapter 8, and you read, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, they came to him to the temple, and all the people came unto him, and they sat with him, and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery. This is a type and shadow of the bride of Christ. It sounds crazy. Oh, I'm not an adulteress. No. It just means this separation from God went and went and worshipped other idols, went and did things in the world. Okay? You got to remember, even Ruth, her name, stranger, when he calls her a stranger, or when she addresses herself as a stranger. It means adulteress. Okay? We've shared these things many times. And so this whole conversation with this woman and then them wanting to stone her and say the law of Moses and being stoned, and Jesus turns around and says, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And he goes down and he bends down and he's writing in the sand almost like he's on one knee. Right? He's bent over writing on the ground, and the woman is standing in the midst. 
Everybody's gone and it's only left, it's only him bent over before her and he looks up and it's only her. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a proposal taking place right there. And then you have the light of the world and so forth. Well, this whole section at the beginning from the very end of John 7 and this beginning of John 8 has thrown so many people off to say that it just doesn't seem right that it belongs here. But the King James has put it here and we have proven many times that it's in the correct spot. Because what are we seeing here? Well, from the end of 7 into the beginning of 8, what are we seeing? Bam, the bride before the Lord. What, what were we seeing in, in Genesis chapter 7? We were seeing the bride going into the ark before, and then chapter 8, boom, the 40 days is over, the Son of Man would be gone, and the 14 years beginning. You see, we have it, it's all the same type and shadow. Well, when we did this, we saw that in chapter 7, and this was from an old brother Charles, as he was doing these studies with us, he says, you know what, because it's such a strange thing, he says, he went to go look to see if there was anywhere else in the Bible that had seven chapters and went beyond 53 verses. And he only found one, and it was the book of Numbers. You come to Numbers chapter 7, and we go to, what was it in John? 7.53 was where it ended. When we come to Numbers, it was 7. Let's start at 54. And look at what it was on the eighth day. Well, this is exactly what we're looking for. It was so crazy because in John chapter 7, we're talking about the seven days of Hanukkah. And when the seven days of Hanukkah come to an end and they're all leaving to go to their own house, we know that it's the eighth day that's taking place. And it's the eighth day in this 50-day count that the bride of Christ is going to be taken and the time of the 40 days of the Son of Man will begin. And here's the woman standing behind before him after those seven days, so sometime on the eighth day. So to see this in Numbers chapter 7 was really, was really quite, quite cool. Following as if it was John. And it says, on the eighth day offered Gamaliel, the son of Padusa, <laughs> prince of the children of Manasseh. And you say, what the heck does that matter? What does this mean? Well, it's the eighth day, which was in a direct correlation continuation from John chapter 7 with a direct correlation to the continuing verse. And look at what Gamil's name is. Reward of God. The son of, look at this. So we've got the reward of God. A rock that is God has ransomed. A rock that is God has ransomed. Prince of the children of Manasseh, or causing to forget. What does that mean? Well, he's he, he, causing to forget. He had to remember them, right? Causing to forget these people. But the key is the reward of God and the rock that is God has ransomed. Who do we know in Scripture that received the reward of God for diligently seeking him and was translated. Who was translated never having tasted of death because he was diligently seeking the Lord and he was rewarded? The same brother we've been talking about here for a long time, Enoch. The bride of Christ is praying to be accounted worthy like Enoch was. You see, because Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and that he is, look at this, a rewarder 
of them that diligently seek him. So first of all, you have to have faith before you can even please God. And then you please God by diligently seeking him, right? By living your life that if somebody was following you and can listen to your thoughts throughout the day, would there be enough evidence that you belong to God, that your thoughts are on him throughout your day, that you love him and you're, you're, you're doing your best in loving others? You see? What happened? He got rewarded. He was rewarded for diligently seeking the Lord. So isn't that a great correlation to the exact person we're looking to experience what he experienced to be like he was? And it was on the eighth day that the reward of God happened by the rock that is God who ransomed. Now that's pretty cool. This gets really interesting because if you notice something, listen to this. On the eighth day, oh wait, I guess it's not Christmas, right? On the ninth day, you see, <laughs> you can hear I'm kind of, I'm not going to actually sing it, right? But what do we have? We have on the first day of Christ, no, on the second day, on the third day, on the fourth day, on the fifth day, on the sixth day, on the seventh day, on the eighth day. What would be the eighth day? And why does this matter? Because remember, it was the twelfth day of the twelve days of Christmas that popped into my head that once she shared that, this was this Numbers chapter seven was what immediately popped into my head. Because Numbers chapter seven has what? 12 days. It's the 12 days and the feast of dedication or the word dedication, which means Hanukkah, out of the eight times it's used, five times in the Old Testament all come from this one chapter. Come on now. All come from this one chapter seven of Numbers. So you see what I'm getting at? If Hanukkah really was connected to December 25th back in the day, and that was the original connection, then maybe it still is the connection because the sun isn't what changes. The sun is constant, right? The months with the moon and the way the, the Hebrew calendar goes with the moon. I know we should use the moon. We should use the sun. We should use the stars. But we have scripture that says that Jesus is the sun. He is the sun. So somebody else might be the moon. Somebody else might represent the stars. But we're told that he is that sun. The S-U-N. So what if we stick on the sun count? Well, guess what? Isn't the sun count 365 days? It's 365 days for the sun count? And we have this whole thing with 12 days of Christmas, and we've got this, this chapter that we've been talking about for a long time, and the three of them connected, and showing this chapter 7 into chapter 8. So what happens when you go into chapter 8? We end up seeing all about lights. Again, like John, after that time of the, that, that eighth day in that count, boom, it's about lights. Jesus says over there, he's the light of the world in John. So now when we come back here, what had troubled me for a long time with this, and this is why I believe it instantly popped into my mind, was because when I looked at this in the past and I said, wow, this is fascinating with this eighth day and this connection and how it flowed perfectly from John 7.53. And it's connected to, to uh, uh, um, Enoch. You know, the, the reward of God. And we're looking that the escape is on the eighth day after seven. So sometime on the eighth day. It's in direct correlation. All of these things are in direct correlation. And so um, you have to understand, when, as we're looking at this, or as I was looking at this in the past, I was always confused 
by saying, well, then what's the ninth? What's the tenth? What's the eleventh? What's the twelfth? And what I mean by that is, are they going to correlate to the the not the next day, but maybe maybe the next year, and then the year after that, and then the year after that? But I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. It only has eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So I don't see how that that flows in relation to years. But why would it count as days? It made no sense as to how this could be a day count from the escape being the reward that the rock has ransomed. What does, what does, look at this, what does the ninth day have anything to do with? Father of judgment, warlike against Benjamin. Ah, we know war is coming to Jerusalem around the time of the escape. Right? So now it starts to make sense. But I understood this before having looked into the names. But now we have the 12 days of Christmas. So what if I plopped in the 12 days of Christmas from Christmas? Let's see where the eighth day lands. One, right? Evening to evening. There's Christmas. Evening to evening. Day one. Day two, day three, four, five, whoops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. December 31st ends in the day portion, ends the seventh day. What would be the eighth day? Right here. The evening. Of the 31st, <laughs> this is so awesome. This this is pretty cool. I'm not saying this is the date, guys. I'm saying I saw something and something popped into my head and it made sense now with these counts that never really made sense to me before except for that one day. I'm going to show you more of these days, okay? So seven days ends and this from the evening of the 31st to the evening of the 1st is the eighth day. So what would what would this be right here? What would the end of this day be right here? How about the 365th day of the year? The 365th day of the year. You know why that's pretty cool? I know many of you guys will remember this. We've talked about it a number of times over the years. I know our sister Maxine in Edmonton, north of me, We had emailed on this a while back as well. And look at this. See, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. 365 years. Why? Doesn't that sound like the only number out of all of these people that is very specific for us to understand? We're talking about a connection years as days meaning Enoch being taken and rewarded for diligently seeking the Lord at 365 years old or days or years as days being what? 365 days? So we have Enoch taken on the eighth day as a reward on 365 never having tasted of death. You see why I was a little bit excited by it? Because the eighth day is the end of the 365th day of the year as Enoch was 365 years. And when he was taken, he was rewarded by God for having diligently sought God. And in Numbers chapter 7, the literal eighth day is the same equivalent of those being rewarded of God who will what? Be ransomed by the rock that is God. And for this to be connected, it should probably have an alignment with Luke. Watch this. With Luke chapter 21. Remember, there's a difference for those of you who don't know. It says in Luke 21 verse 25. 
And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity and the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. Okay, something's causing all this distress of nations and the waves roaring, probably because the Lord is coming close. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Listen to this. Men's hearts failing them for fear for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. They're coming and impending to arrive, attack the earth. Okay? For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. The whole world? No. Those who are watching. And it's in. Who's, who's all going to see him? Well, he's in. The whole world isn't going to see him. Only those who were watching will be ready and will see him in a single cloud, you see, with power and great glory. Do you know, for those that are newer, when you go to Mark's discourse and it talks about the Lord, the Son of Man coming, it's different. And do you know why it's different? Because this is at the end of seals. Listen to what it says. Uh, for in those days after that tribulation. Huh. Luke's never talked about the word tribulation. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Huh? Luke's never talked about that. The stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. When do the stars fall? The sixth seal. And then shall they see the son of man coming in. It's also the word in, but look at what it says. Clouds, plural. It's very different. When you go to Matthew, it's different yet again because this is him coming at the end of trumpets in that seventh year of trumpets. And listen to what it says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon and I'll give her light. This is all the stuff at the end of the sixth, uh, uh, the end of the sixth trumpet to the seventh trumpet. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. Right? Uh, and then shall they see the son of man coming, not in, The word in there actually means on the clouds. Why is it going to be seen coming on the clouds? Because this is now the end of tribulation. This is the end of trumpets when he will come feet down on the Mount of Olives as lightning from one end to the other for the whole world to see. This is when the whole world will see him. He's not in the clouds for just a group that will see him because they're watching and ready for him. Okay, This is when the whole world will see him. So now when we go back to Luke chapter 21, remember the title of this video. When we come back to Luke 21, we see these things coming upon the earth. Do they hit while the bride is here? No. No. It says those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And what were we looking for? We're looking for that word that the the rock who is God has ransomed. Okay? And when these things begin to come to pass, then lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. That means your what? Your ransom is at hand. Your full ransoming is at hand. Watch this. Let's have a look at this one. So you can see this this connection starts to get really exciting because, watch this, out of all the Gospels that word ransomed is in, it's only in Luke 21, verse 28. It's in no other Gospel, brothers and sisters. And that is important because this ransoming is that ransom in full for the reward of those diligently seeking him at a time when things will be seen coming toward the earth. Kind of sounds like a movie that just recently came out, doesn't it? Well, don't worry, we're going we're gonna to keep digging into this, okay? So remember, this is all this 12 days of Christmas. And the eighth day of Christmas is literally 
the 365th day of the year, just like our brother Enoch, 365 years. Okay, we've, sh we've shown in many videos that days are referenced as years in the end and years are referenced as days. We've even shown it as thousands of years for days, right? Fascinating stuff. So now what happens? Well, what time of year is this? Isn't it a time of year when, when people are drinking and getting drunk and doing all that stuff? Well, what if we continue to this portion here? Listen to what it says. Remember, guys, this is all tied into John 7 to 8, Numbers 7, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Genesis 7 into 8. Listen to what it says. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness, okay, with drunkenness and intoxication and the cares of this life. How many Christians do you know, professing Christians, the churchgoers, that just are caught up in these cares of the world? That say, give me the jab. You know, yeah, yeah, sure. The pastor's telling me to get it. Let's all go get it. And they all go get it so that they can still keep living their lives, right? They want to see their grandkids. They, they want to have their children have grandkids and experience grandkids. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying don't get caught up in all the cares of this life. Be aware of these things going on in the world right now when we look around and understand that this isn't normal to be able to do this to the whole world at the same time. We are here. But you see this timing when the world is in drunkenness. You know, this is something in 1 Thessalonians 5 that many people have spoken about as well. Right? For you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, sudden travail will come upon them. Da, 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 da. Darkness in that day. Da, 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 da. Here it is. Verse 6. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep at sleep in the night, and they that are drunken, are drunken in the night. See, those who are asleep, sleeping church, and those who are drunken, caught up in the cares of the world. They're going to miss what is being told. They're going to miss the understanding of what this all is. And the whole world, that's why it says the whole world. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Okay? Not the bride of Christ, not those ready and watching, not Enoch, they're already gone. But see how this timing is, is quite interesting? It's connected to this eighth day, which is something we've understood now for a long time. And this eighth day is that portion of the 50, the first portion, after seven. Listen, this is one of our key verses. Everybody knows this one, right? Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Well, to escape all things. All, all what things? All of these things that are listed here. So who are these people stuck in this portion? Who are these people experiencing this portion? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that because it's directly connected to, this, to these things. You're going to see something that we've spoken about a number of times recently and in the past with this Barcoba revolt and all these things, this, this group of two sets of 12,000 that I say are the missing type and shadow of the 12,000 and 12,000 that are missing from Dan and Ephraim that I believe are the seals workers, not the 144, but the group that will work seals. I've talked about it many times. You're going to see how they're connected to this again in something that I came across today that is today or, or yesterday that it didn't it, it I wasn't even looking for it and you're going to see its direct correlation but let me continue here with Luke 21 listen to the end of Luke this is one of the ways I knew that John the very end of 7 but in particular the beginning of 8 was in its correct order because Luke's the only gospel that ends with this after his discourse verse 37 and 38 of, of Luke 21 and in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode 
in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives, and all the people came early in the morning to him uh, in the temple for to hear him. Well, remember, what are we talking about? A group escaping all of these things to go stand before the Son of Man. And the very next verse is about a group going to the Mount of Olives where he is, and all the people came to him early in the morning. Well, if John chapter 7 is telling us about the seven days, and when the seven days come to an end, and this connection gives us to the eighth day, and so we follow into John chapter 8, look at what we see. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him and sat down for it, and he taught them. Isn't that similar? That's almost identical to the end of Luke's discourse. And bam, the woman was brought before him. But guess what? When the woman is brought before him, she's now gone. This is the the typology. This This is the Enoch bride group that has been removed from the earth, that has pre trib escaped, that has that has uh uh such as one like a rapture, like a caught up, like a harpazo from 2 Corinthians 12, 2. That goes to the third heaven. She's now removed. She's out of the way. The reward has been given and the world is now in chaos. And it happened at some point on the eighth day. And like Enoch, potentially connected this 365 years to 365 days at a time while we're running on the solar clock. With the sun as the sun. Let me show you something else. Remember how we've been sharing this in Luke? Luke chapter 22. We see things like... um, Where are you? Did I go through too fast? You guys know what I'm talking about. Stone's throw, here it is. So here we have, again, Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. Uh, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And it says, And he was withdrawn from them a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. So he's telling us that he's a stone's throw away. Why does this matter to us? This was about, what, two days, I think, two to three days before his crucifixion, right? Or, sorry, sorry, the, the, when he was taken. This is, uh, he's about to be taken here, okay, by Judas when they, J, Judas betrays him and they come and take him. This is when they come and lay hands on him and this is the beginning. So, yeah, this happened at the, at the Passover. They had had their Passover in, in the first portion and then they come, he goes up and prays and he's a stone's throw away. You don't read this in in John. You don't read this in the synoptics of Mark and Matthew. It's only in Luke. And it has always fascinated us because does this mean that it's going to hit and the bride is going to be a part of it? Well, here's what's interesting. He's saying that he's a stone's throw away. Over in John chapter 8, The woman is now standing before him. This is the eighth day and the bride has been taken. And we have this type and shadow of this woman that was standing there before him in in what had happened in that time. And they wanted to stone her. So in the type and shadow, the bride is gone. And there's this conversation about wanting to send stones, wanting to throw stones. And Jesus turns around and says to them, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up his eyes, John 8, verse 7, and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Who there was without sin standing amongst them? Only Jesus. This is Jesus saying only he can throw the first stone. And when we see over in the story in Luke 22, we see that there's a stone that's being thrown. 
that he's a stone's throw away. Not that it hits right away, but that it would appear we're going to see the stone's throw coming. You see? And so when you look at this, what did it say? He's a stone's throw away in Luke 22. When does he show up? On the eighth day. Being the one who was the only one who could cast the stone. You see how that's building? And you say, whoa. And then we go to Luke chapter 21 again. And we see what? We see that at this time, that the bride of Christ is to be redeemed, is to be ransomed. It'll be at a time when the world will see and they will fear and men's hearts will fail them for looking at these things coming upon the earth. Coming. But then the bride is removed before they land. Just like it's showing us. He's a stone's throw away. He shows up at the eighth day. The bride is already gone. He shows up at the eighth day. And there's that stone. There's that stone that was cast. Here they come. You see? Because watch this. In Numbers chapter 7, brothers and sisters, the first day of Christmas, the second day of Christmas, third day of Christmas, right? All of these, it, it instantly hit me that these were like the 12 days of Christmas. And it even said the day. Eighth day, ninth day, ten. It was so awesome. I was so excited when it struck me. So, Here's the escape, and it would be the same time that then the escape happens, and now the Lord is here. The Son of Man is here for 40 days. Now let's go to see what happens on the ninth day of Christmas. Father of judgment, warlike Benjamin, son of the right hand, right? The right side. Who's Benjamin? Judah. Right? That connection to Jerusalem. So is this where war, the first attack maybe, something like this happens at the beginning in Jerusalem? In, in the land, maybe in Israel or in Judah? Remember, we've talked about this potential that there's one attack and then things settle down and then there's this second attack. Well, let's see what happens on the 10th day. On the 10th day, we have brother of help. Well, this starts to get interesting. Because then I show you that when the Son of Man is here for 40 days, he's meeting with that Luke group, right? The two, the two on the road to Emmaus, the two that represent these disciples that were with the Lord for 40 days, that then received power at the 50th day with the Holy Ghost. You see? We're going to talk about these people more in a little bit. You're going to see how this is connected. It's pretty wild. So we've got brother of help, people of the Almighty. Why are they people of the Almighty? Because they were part of the bride group. This is that group we've been teaching for a long time, is that Priscilla and Aquila group from Romans 16. Okay? This is that Priscilla group, that tribe of Dan. You see, the children of Dan. Judge. Why Dan? Because if you remember, Dan has a good side and a bad side. Dan is the Scorpio that either becomes an overcomer and is an eagle, which is like Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila. Aquila is from the tribe of Dan. He is the eagle. His name means Aquila, the eagle. And being from the tribe of Dan, they are what? The ones representing those who are going to be with the Lord for 40 days. And they're going to receive that power from the Holy Spirit. And they're going to work during seals, putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, just like Romans chapter 16 says. So that's now the 10th day. So that's just a couple days later after he arrives. What about the 11th day, guys? This starts to get pretty crazy. Are you ready for this? On the 11th day, let's just see, what would the 11th day be? So there's the 8th. Okay. To the evening of the first. There's the ninth. There's the tenth. Here's the eleventh day. 
So if this count was from is from uh, uh, Christmas, this is the eleventh day, that third into the fourth of January. Let's see what it says, because remember, if Christ is showing up, if this if this count is to be understood and is correct, then right here is when the bride goes, and the Lord shows up in this period of time from the evening of the thirty first to the evening of the first. The Lord shows up and will begin his 40 days. Which means the stone's throw would be seen maybe somewhere around here. Maybe in the next two to three days or four days, maybe we'll see something in the sky. But it's not going to land yet. It's not going to hit. Because it said coming, remember? But then at this point here, this is the 11th day. The bride is gone. The Son of Man has met with the disciple group. And it's now the 11th day. What can happen on the 11th day? On the 11th day, listen to this. Pegio, it's called accident of God. You're like, what do you mean accident? How is there an accident of God? Well, let's go see what this word means. Accident of God comes from impact. Impact. An impact from God, the son of muddler, which means roiling of water to disturb, trouble, stir up, afflict water. So... An accident of God, which is an impact hitting water that afflicts it, that stirs it up, that troubles the water and roils the water on the 11th day. Well, guess what? Do you know where this exact same thing happens? It shouldn't be seen in, in Luke. It should be seen as something that afflicts Mark's group of people. And do you know what it says? In Mark's discourse, Mark, it doesn't say it in Matthew's discourse. It doesn't say it in Luke's discourse. It says it in Mark's. Listen to this. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. And troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Look at this word troubles. Remember, here's the Hebrew word from muddler. When this impact hits the earth, it's going to royal water. It's going to be trouble. Oh, look at the word troubles, trouble. But let's make sure we understand it in the Greek from the Hebrew. Okay, roiling water. Look at that. A disturbance that is of water, roiling, troubling. Of water. When would when is it supposed to happen? After the bride escapes. And all of a sudden, we've got these 12 days of Christmas type thing going on. There are 12 of them, and the eighth one is the escape. The eighth one is the escape. The the ninth one is war breaking out or beginning or surrounding and things starting in Israel. Then you've got the disciple group being chosen to help. In fact, let me show you that with Romans. In Romans chapter 16, here it is. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, whom have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. You see, these are the first fruits workers. These are those that were part of the this bride group that were chosen to work. They were chosen to remain. Some will be, some will die. Some will be put to death. Not all of them, but some will die along the way with those protecting others and doing their thing in seals. That's why they're putting their necks on the line. 
You see, just like those who are going to be raised from the dead to live with the Lord for the millennial reign. This is that group. This is precisely that group. And look, Aquila is the eagle. That's the eagle side of Dan. You see how awesome that is? Well, now we're seeing this timing and it's it's getting pretty wild, isn't it? So, yes, uh, uh, yeah, it was yesterday, last night. I'm now, I had already started going through this and prepping some of this stuff and looking at these things. And I'm thinking, wow, man, this is getting really wild. So I'm going through these things. I'm putting this all together. And then I thought, you know, this whole thing, you know, are we, is this really the time? Lord, are we understanding it? You know, there, there's two options for the season and time. It's either got to be at the, the time of, um, uh, 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 of <laughs> come on now, the time of, of the Feast of Weeks, or it has to be this connection to Hanukkah. It can only really be one of the two if John and Jesus are six months apart. And so I've always said that, or especially because there's only two options for eight days circumcision biblically one of them is tabernacles and the other one is hanukkah but tabernacles that's not lambing season it's never lambing season at that time and we know from the native sheep that are in israel and are the native ones to that land for thousands of years are the awasi sheep and we see that they lamb the lambing season the the core portion of the lambing season is from december to january and so I think, you know, there are certain things you think, oh, man, OK, OK, this is making sense. OK, that's why the shepherds were in the field. Shepherds are as Ruth. But there's still some other things that this is why I'm still going to look into these other things that our brother Ivan is sharing. And it, because there's still some things there. And maybe if this time, you know, we come towards the middle of January if, and things haven't changed, then maybe that's the next place we need to look. But we're not going to worry about going there now. But know that we can take a deep breath, and I'm going to still keep bringing in some awesome teachings, including this next one coming up, and just continue to keep us watching. Why? Because soon we will be like Enoch if we remain diligent in seeking the Lord, if we remain diligent in our faith with the Lord. Okay? Love, brothers and sisters. And that's why I'll do it no matter how cold it is, as long as I got a heater. So... <laughs> So here I was thinking, well, what about this six-month thing? And I, I thought, you know what? Let me do a little digging and see what I come across. So I do some digging, as I told you guys in the beginning. I do some digging to look up to see what kind of information I could find about Luke chapter 1 and how maybe people have discerned this six-month and in six-month um, in relation to Elizabeth and Mary. And I do believe I understand it to an extent uh, that it's not the sixth month, but I might be a little biased in where I'm standing right now because of what we're looking at. So I'll, I'll put that to the side for now. But what had happened is that's what I was looking for. And I click on this link and this guy's talking about it. He's talking about those six months and so forth. And he's talking about these things that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and how these two columns of fragments that were found relate, he believes, to, to an extent with this with some of the wording found in Luke. And as I was reading what he was talking about, I was thinking to myself, what are you talking about? You know, and, and you could read it here. I'm going to read it in another place because this is this is just you know, it's a different wording of translation. We're going to go to a more direct source. And so um, it's called the Qumran, uh, um, uh, 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 what is it? The Qumran, uh, um, come on now, pieces, whatever you want to call it. And it, they're called the 4Q246. So he goes on to say, the interpretation of them are disputed. John Collins, he says, and others think that, is a, that it is a messianic text. It is a vision concerning the coming, coming Messiah. 
Others say, no, actually, it's about the coming false messiah, antichrist figure, for example. And others still aren't sure if it's messianic, but perhaps it's a future Jewish king through whom God will work. <laughs> Doesn't this sound familiar? Doesn't this sound like everything we teach when it comes to Matthew? When people say they're they're looking at something and and it, it doesn't correlate. They they want to say pre-trib, but pre-trib has nothing to do with Matthew, but they read other scripture and so they say, no, it's pre-trib, so it's before here. But really what they're saying is mid-trib because they don't understand who the gospels are speaking to. They don't understand the 14 years. And that's what we see going on here. This mishmash of stuff. And so I'm looking at this and I'm just following it. And so I'm like, well, what is this 4Q? And I read a little bit about it up here. And I said, well, this is getting pretty interesting. So I'm going to look at it a little bit closer. And I find this Brill.com. And sorry, I never click on these cookie things to allow. And so you find, that's it, the, the transcriptions, the transcripts, all right, of the 4Q246. And it's talking about these Dead Sea Scrolls, right? These manuscripts, these fragments, that's what I want to say. These fragments that were found. And it goes in to discuss these fragments. Well, check this out. Let me show this to you. This is that. I just downloaded it. This, they have it in the Hebrew, but it was they said it was in, uh, I think, Aramaic. Now, the first column is difficult. But then the second column is much more clear. Listen to this. Settled upon him and fell before the throne. The eternal king, rage is coming, and your years. Your vision, and everything will come for eternity. Wars, oppression, will come upon the earth, and great slaughter in the cities. Kings of Assyria and Egypt, hello, so we talk about Assyria is coming, will be great upon the earth. They will serve and everything something. The great will he be called and his name, they will call him great. Will he call himself and by his name, he shall designate himself. Now, if this was all you were reading, you would say, man, what's even the point of finding that, that, that fragment, right? It's very, very difficult. But listen to the second one. And with everything we were just talking about, this is suddenly brought to me in a search for Luke chapter 1, trying to discern more about the two versions of six months in Luke chapter 1. What, what the heck is that about? This has nothing to do with it. But it was where I was led to click. And listen to what the second part says. This is the second fragment. And it says, He shall be appointed the Son of God. They shall call him the Son of the Most High, like the meteors which you saw. <laughs> so shall their kingdom be. For some years... They shall be kings over the earth and trample everything down. People shall trample down people. Cities shall trample down cities. Hello. Hello. Isn't that exactly what we were talking about? When does the trampling take place? Okay, this is the first portion. This is World War III and all this stuff breaking out. What does Luke say about it? Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We can go to Second Ezra. It says, People against people, nation against nation, king, neighbor against neighbor. And great earthquakes, and all of these things take place. But what does Luke say? But before all these. Okay? So before all this takes place, we know that there's this portion of time, which is that 40, 50 days to the beginning of the 14 years. So we've got this beginning portion that goes up to this time here, and then it's Jerusalem having been surrounded, but they're not being attacked yet. And then it's talking about now is going to go till the time of the end of the Gentiles to the end of the end, the, till the end of seals. And then it goes into talking about what we talked about earlier. This is what we're going to see. This is going to be this beginning portion of time. 
So before the nation against nation kicks in and the people against people and the kingdom against kingdom and all that kicks in and everybody's trampling on everybody, what happens first? Men's hearts failing them for fear of looking at those things which are coming on the earth. And then those who are part of the escape, those sons of God, will be seeing him in a cloud coming. And that's when we know the redemption, the reward and full ransom, which is the reward of God, is coming. So before the trampling comes, these things are going to be seen in the sky. And what is it? What did it say? He shall be appointed the Son of God, and they shall call him the Son of the Most High, like the meteors <laughs> which you saw, show, so shall their kingdom be. For many years shall they reign kings and the trample down and city upon city and all these things. And then it says, until the people of God shall rise and everything shall rest from the sword. So now what does this mean? Until the people of God rise and everything shall rest. This is the end of seals. This one here is talking about the rapture. After the trampling down and treading of people and beheadings and all of that stuff, then the people of God shall rise and everything shall rest from the sword. Of course it's going to rest from the sword. you guys remember? That's the exact conversation we were talking about earlier. At the end of the six years of seals, you see that Ezekiel 39 war took place. When it's over, they're going to burn the weapons now for seven years. That's exactly what this is saying. It's saying that now when these people rise at the time of the rapture after the battle, the swords will be no more. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. So now it's talking about the Lord and all his paths of truth. The earth is truth and he will make peace. The sword will end from the earth because this is the seven years of burning and they, they bang him into plowshares, right? And all the cities will worship him. The great God is his strength and he himself. So I thought this was really interesting piece but what caught my attention was like meteors, which you saw. This is precisely what I was talking about. I was in this study showing exactly these connections that there's the escape, this war about to break out in Israel. The, the, the two people walking to Emmaus, those two that would work as the hundred, uh, uh, sorry, as the, the two sets of 12,000 during seals. And then what? The stone's throw. The stone's throw actually hitting. <laughs> this is what it's saying. So prior to that, the stones were seen coming, but by the 11th day, according to this, if, we're, if this is to be understood, as the 12 days of Christmas in this connection, then on the 11th day, the accident of God, which is an impact, is going to muddle the waters with a roiling of water. Hello. That's pretty crazy. And I found that because of this, this these fragments. I wasn't looking for anything about fragments, anything. I was looking for a connection to Luke, and this is what the Lord led me to. So then what? Well, I start looking into this stuff about the scrolls, because if you guys recall, there were scroll fragments from the Dead Sea that were also discovered in 2021. Beginning 2020 research, uh, beginning, sorry, 2017 researchers discovered a bunch of scrolls. And listen to this. So the scroll fragments that I'm talking to you about right now, these two, okay, the two dozen scroll pieces, each measuring a few centimeters, okay, these fragments that I'm talking to you about 
right here with the meteors which you saw, which comes before the kingdom against kingdom, trampling down and so forth, which puts it in order. These fragments were found, and guess what? You want to see when it's believed that they were put there? Check this out. Two dozen scrolls, each measuring only a few centimeters across uh, from the so-called Cave of Horror near the western shore of the Dead Sea. It's a site where insurgents were believed to have hidden during the uprising led by Simon Barcoba. Remember the Barcoba revolt I was telling you about? Against the Roman Empire in 30, 133 to 136 A.D. And I said, oh, my Lord, there it is again, this Barcoba revolt. So I go to look into it further. And what else happened? You got it right. In March of 2021, the archaeologists, Israeli archaeologists, announced the discovery of a dozen of the fragments, okay, bearing biblical text written in Greek from the books of Zechariah and Nehemiah, this particular group of findings are believed to be hidden in a cave between 132 CE and 136 during the Barcoba revolt. <laughs> How many times have we talked about this group? You see, for those of you who have been watching for a little while, and those of you who are new, Ministry Revealed also wrote a book. All right? Wrote a book in March of, was it this year? Yeah, March of 2021. And it's 280-some pages. You can download it for free uh, in PDF form from ministryrevealed.com. You can find the link under this video. You can also go buy the book so you can share it with people, and it's going to blow you away. Well, this is the part that talks about the seven churches. And we're also going to touch about touch on this in the next video when we detail this timing of the son of perdition. But this is the revelation, which is another magnificent revelation about the seven churches in their revelation of the end of days. I've talked about how we have the, the, the uh, uh, BC, the Old Testament, this played out over a couple thousand, three thousand years. We have this church history this that we're in right now. It's playing out over two thousand years. But then there is church future, and what took two to three thousand years, what's played out over two thousand years in the end of days is going to play out in less than fourteen years. That is how crazy the end of days are going to be. So anybody who tries to tell you the tribulation has begun, they have not studied enough scripture to understand what tribulation literally means. All right? Well, here's what we're talking about. Smyrna, all right? Smyrna is this worker group, okay? The apostle group represented as the Ephesus church. This is what? The day of Israel's espousals. That's the time of the espousals. You see, that what? That first seven to eight days before the 40 days, right? After seven days, then the 40 days of the Son of Man. It's during the time of Israel's espousals. When he comes and begins his 40 days, remember I told you that Dan group represented by Priscilla and Aquila? These time periods are approximate time periods. They could be debated, but they're within the range. What happens at this point? This is between 100 AD and about 300 AD. It's not the persecution where they're flying into the wilderness yet, but it's per it's beginning. Roman persecution is beginning. Okay? It's getting bad, but it's going to get worse. And that's when the fleeing into the wilderness at mid seals takes place. But what is this group? This is those that some of you they shall put to death. This is that group that puts their necks on the line working for the Gentile churches, okay? This is that group that we're saying is representation of those two sets of 12,000 that are like Priscilla and Aquila, that are like the two on the road to Emmaus, that are a type and shadow 
to this group, not that they were a part of the Bar Kokhba revolt, but there was a Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Akiva, who was associated during this time of the Bar Kokhba revolt and knew the guy uh, Simon Bar Kokhba, he uh, um, Rabbi Akiva had. 12,000 and 12,000 disciples that followed him. Two sets of 12,000. And the period of time of the Bar Kokhba revolt and when these guys were there as a part of it was during 132 to 136 CE. And I've been teaching here for a while now, probably a couple of years, that this group represented right here is the end time type and shadow of this Smyrna group. Remember, what took thousands of years of playing out is going to play out over a simple period of 14 years. This is the first seven days of the 50 days. This begins the time of the 40 days of the Son of Man. But the apostles and these Smyrna workers putting their necks on the line, are still going to be working during the rest of seals. But they're chosen by the Lord. They're the disciples with the Lord at that time. This is that group in Dan that I showed was the ninth, the 10th day. Right in its perfect timing. Okay? This is that group. And here they are again being represented with these scroll fragments. If you guys remember, see this 132 to 136? So what is the type and shadow of this time? The type and shadow of this time is when the Son of Man is here for 40 days. And he meets with this group. He, he gathers this group of disciples to him. Right near the beginning of the 40 days. So who do they represent? The timing of this group of Rabbi Akiva's 12,000 and 12,000 disciples. Why am I harping on this? Because the type and shadow of what was that's in the is to come is represented by this time as the beginning time frame of the 40 days when the Son of Man is here choosing this new group of disciples or choosing this group of disciples as the Priscilla and Aquila, as the two walking to Emmaus. And why does it matter? Because I'm going to show you that right here, it was in the TV series. Do you guys remember that TV series, Messiah? You see right here? This was the Netflix TV series, Messiah. And everybody debated and said that this wasn't the Messiah, but that he was the Antichrist. Don't listen to it. Don't listen. He's the Antichrist. They're trying to trick everybody because it's movies and everything else. It's Netflix. <clears throat> so don't believe it. It's the Antichrist. Well, do you know what the Muslims were saying at the same time? They were saying, this is the Antichrist. This is the Dajjal. Hey, Christians, this is the Dajjal, your Antichrist. But do you know what the, what the Muslims say? They say the Dajjal is only here for 40 days. How about that? We don't say the Antichrist is here for 40 days. We say he's here for all of seals. But he gets his power at mid-seals, his greater power at mid-seals, when he's really going to have authority. He's not only here for 40 days, but the Muslim's Dajjal guy is here for 40 days. Why? Because the Dajjal is not the Antichrist. He is the Son of Man here for 40 days. And those of you who are new and are hearing this, go watch the intro video that talks about the 40 days. You haven't understood it because everything was taught from Matthew. You want to know why I share this? Because this TV series was about this Messiah character being here for a period of time, for a short period of time. And this is when he was in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount on the stairs. And there was an incident with a shooting in the show. And all of a sudden, he leaves through the crowd with everybody else. The kid was, was healed. The bullet came out. And now there's this manhunt to say, who is this guy? Because people are starting to go crazy over who this guy is. Do you want to know what's fascinating about it? 
this is a type and shadow of the period of time of him being in Jerusalem and him warning the people that the time of wrath, the time of tribulation is at hand, like we've been teaching. And we've been teaching that this group related to the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt, which is through Akiva, not so much those with Bar Kokhba, but through Akiva that are connected to this time of 132 to 136 AD. And look at what the picture says. 132-136. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? There is no number on this picture. There's no number anywhere else. It has zero meaning to the context of the entirety of the show. But to those with eyes to see, it was crystal clear why they put 132 to 136. Because they were showing that this guy was actually being portrayed for the Son of Man who is coming for 40 days at the beginning. And this period of time was related to what? Him gathering those people. Him gathering the disciples. Right? The Smyrna church. During this period while he's here for 40 days. That's the Dan group. Which would have to take place near the beginning of his 40 days. Just like Priscilla and Aquila. That's pretty wild. That is crazy wild. Well, it goes a little bit further because then I'm looking at these things with these fragments. And if you remember, what about these fragments that were put here during this time for these people? Well, in March of 2021, there was fragments found of Zechariah and Nahum. And the fragments... Of Zachary, oh, you know what? Before I go there, let me finish up this. Let me finish up with this image and this series, Messiah. <laughs> this is so awesome. All right. Are you ready for this? <laughs> this series that has this number on his image, which is directly related to the time that he would be here as the type and shadow. For the disciples, when he begins his 40 days, just like Luke chapter 24, represents what? The beginning of the Son of Man's 40 days. When does the Son of Man's 40 days begin, according to this count on, the, on our calendar? Right? According to this, the bride goes around right here. And the Lord would be here sometime around the 1st of January, according to this eighth day. Bride goes on the eighth day. It's the reward of the rock that is ransomed. And then he's here to begin his 40 days as Luke chapter 24 shows us, as we've broken down many times. So that would be January 1st, right? So January 1st and the timing of this guy right in line with this timing of events. Are you ready for this? That TV show, Messiah, was released by Netflix on January 1st in 2020. <laughs> Come on. Are you kidding me? It was released on January 21st, the day that it would appear this connection is directly related that we've been showing is January 1st to the start of his 40 days. No, they can't be that knowing, can they? Is this the spirit in them revealing these things to us? They launched it on January 1st. When I was doing these, when I was looking at this today and I'm putting this together and I'm saying, well, that's the eighth day of Christmas. It's like starts right here. We know after seven. So early in the morning on the eighth day, this, this is the timing of the bride leaving, right? This is, the, this is the time of the bride. So while everybody's drinking and getting drunk, this might very well be when the bride goes. And after the bride's gone, the Son of Man shows up. And when I realized it was the 1st of January, I said, hold on a second. That show with that number in Messiah was released on January 1st. I remembered seeing it. 
And I said, oh my goodness, is this possible? Isn't that crazy? Man. <laughs> I was, you see, you put all these things together and we see all these connections and you think, Lord, did, did, have we understood it? Are we actually here? Are we understanding it more in detail now because it's at hand? You know, or or is it just more information being built? I I don't I don't know. You know, I can't tell you for sure. I don't have like a a crystal clean count of 50 days. Oh, this this is pretty darn good. You know, and going right to that 10th, 11th day and so forth. I mean, that that's pretty bang on. But I, I, I don't have this direct count to the 50th day that, that I would say, okay, that looks like it lines up. But we know we're in the season and time. We know now the, the lambing season and those that were from Israel. We've, we've talked for years about this potential of, of Enoch being 365 years to represent 365 days in a type and shadow. But you got to scratch your head and you say, well, why would it be off a Gregorian calendar and not off the truth from going from spring to spring or even from fall to fall? Why would it be working like this? Well, then recently we've got all this info with the sun and we see that he's the sun and him as the sun and the tabernacle from the sun. You start saying, well, huh, maybe running on a 365, maybe the Lord already had it planned, knowing what was coming knowing that the world for which he was coming into that time, because this isn't the time of Judah, this is the time of the rest of Israel, right? The house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in. That maybe it was planned on the Gregorian. Is as bizarre as that sounds even to say. But <laughs> I just showed you a 12 days of Christmas that aligns to the last day of the year, 365, where we would be rewarded, that has a connection to where the first Hanukkah was, and that it's the eighth day we're looking for from John 7 going into John 8, related to Genesis 7 going into 8, connected to uh, Numbers chapter 7 in particular, you can say going into 8, but in particular John uh, uh, Numbers chapter 7, and it has 12 days in it, and there's a meaning behind those names. And the eighth day is precisely that last day. And then the next day being the first, when, when there's some events taking place with Israel and war building. And we're told in Luke chapter 21 that they're going to be compassed about during that time. And that during that time, we will have seen things coming, but they won't hit until after we're gone. And that's what the 10th day is. Man, I, I know I, I'm not getting every piece that I think I should understand, but I'll tell you what, this is looking pretty darn exciting. And as I speak to you now, we're right here. My wife was wondering, well, what do the, the first day and the second day and the third and the fourth and the fifth, what do these days represent? And I've looked at them and I don't know, I can't really make much sense of what all of them are. I can make a couple here and there, but there really wasn't anything. Like, what's this one? God of hearing on the seventh day, people of splendor, double portion, right? Double fruit. I don't really know what that association is to mean. But we know the eighth day connection. We've known it for a long time. See, for those wondering, why after seven days? Why is it after seven being the eighth? Well, that's what the Ark story said too. For yet seven days. And then it says, and it came to pass after seven days that the waters were upon the earth. So it wasn't until after seven days, which is now the eighth day, and in that self same day, on the eighth day, after seven, God shut them in. He closed the door. And the 40 days began on the earth. This is the storyline we've been talking about for a long time. 
And now we got some pretty crazy connections. Pretty crazy connections. Let me show you these Dead Sea Scrolls now. Remember what we were talking about. These, this Zechariah and Nahum. So the scroll fragments found this year in March, they were from Zechariah. Let me show you. Zechariah chapter 8. And for us, here's the thing. When we look at this and we say, oh, Zechariah chapter 8, well, that's not for us now. Well, I agree. It's not for us now. But what the timing of it is, is to Judah. This timing is to Judah. Okay? So look at it in a perspective of the Lord telling them to smarten up. This is what it was. It was Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16 and 17 that were found on those fragments in, uh, uh, in March of this year. And they were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Part of the, that portion. And it says, these are the things that you shall do. Speak every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath. For all these things that I uh, uh, for all these things are things that I hate, saith the Lord. Doesn't this sound like like him speaking to his people saying, hey, it, start doing these things. Start executing proper judgment and peace and truth. And if you could start doing these things, what do you think he was warning them? Do you think he's maybe he was trying to let them know, hey, smarten up. If you guys will correct your ways, I won't I won't do what's coming. Now, knowing what's coming. Were they going to understand it? Were they all going to suddenly correct their ways? No. But they were warned. They've heard about these fragments. It's always exciting news when fragments are found. So if this was the warning, what was the warning for? Well, how about we go have a look at Nahum chapter 1. <clears throat> and it was verse 5 and 6. It's going to sound familiar to everything we've been talking about to this point. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth burned at his presence. Yea, and the world, yea, the world, and they that dwell therein. Remember when he comes close, the mountains are going to quake. Remember, the, the, the heavens are going to shake. Psalms 18. Then listen to verse 6. Nahum 1 verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? Listen to this. In the fierceness of his anger, his ire, his nose, his nostrils. Does that sound familiar to things we've been talking about? How about Psalms 18, which comes before Psalms 19, which is the beginning of tribulation. Look at this. The earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills removed and were shaken because he was wroth. See, from his what? Anger. And there went up smoke from his nostrils. See? Same word. Same word. Fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens and came down. This is what Nahum's talking about. Zechariah was given the warning, and the Nahum fragment is saying that he's coming down. And listen what's happening when he comes down with his fierce anger. His fury is poured out like fire. Here it comes. And the rocks are thrown down by him. Boom. How about that? How about that finish, brothers and sisters? How about it? And the rocks are thrown down by him. 
Isn't that exactly what this warning is all about? This warning of what's about to begin? That the world is going to see these things coming upon the earth? That the powers of heaven shall be shaken? He is the one who can cast those stones. He will be throwing these rocks. But they will not hit until after those redeemed in the redemption of the reward of God. Like our dear brother Enoch that we have spoken about so often who was translated, okay? Who was transported, carried over like the bride that would not see death, would not taste of death because of being translated, because of faith in him and believing that he was a rewarder of them that diligently sought him. Look at what Luke says, and then I'll finish with this. In Luke chapter 9, you guys know it well. Starting in verse 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory. That's that's what we were talking about in, in Luke 21. Okay, When the stones are being thrown and he's coming. And his fathers and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And look at the very next verse. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. Why? Because the story of the transfiguration, if you go watch the pre, mid, and post video for anybody that's new, you will understand that this is a type and shadow of the Lord coming as the Son of Man for 40 days during a period. Yes, the apostles will know, disciples will come to him, but the world will reject him because they're going to think he is the Antichrist Dajjal when in fact he's going to be the Son of Man here for 40 days. Brothers and sisters, I love you. I pray for you and your families. I know you guys pray for us and your support, and your love, and your intercession. We appreciate it so much. I know that we are protected and blessed in all things, and I am so grateful. I hope and pray with all I can that we have understood this time as well, brothers and sisters. It is so connected. It's, it's kind of freaky, isn't it? I really, really hope and pray. But you know what? We're not going to get too bent out of shape, are we? Because we have faith. We have faith and we're going to continue to diligently seek him regardless of the outcome. You see, let me end it with this very last piece. I then go to look at Enoch to say, well, when was Enoch taken? When is this connection to 365 years, maybe as days? And I thought, you know, because I'm comparing these things with, with what, what's being shared with us here in the forum as 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 a possibility that our brother really is strongly believing in. And I'm, I'm trying to compare the two. And I, I say, but, you know, we, we know that, that with Enoch, it was snow, 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 snow when he was taken. So how can it be in summer? So I, I, I really hold hope on the fact that it says snow. But I then come and look at, at Enoch and what's believed the timing of him being taken by God and listen to what it says. One group believes July 30th. Another group believes July 19th. So they would be more in line with our brother Ivan in this connection that, that Christ's birth is really connected to this time in, you know, in that summerish time frame with, with, uh, with Feast of Weeks. And so I'm thinking, oh, July 30th, July 19th. Well, they're really close to each other. But <laughs> there's another group that says the 22nd of January and another group that says the 3rd of January. So you've got two close together and two close together. One <laughs> reflects the time we're talking about and one reflects the time our brother Ivan is talking about. 
And so I was no closer. It didn't help at all <laughs> looking up this info on Enoch, except when I come back to this apocryphal book about snow, 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 snow. And there is no way it was snow in that June, July time frame. So that's where I'm going to I'm going to add to hang to my hat there for this period of time that we're in. But we will also always continue to hold our heads high because we will continue to dig and I will continue to do my part and my job for the Lord. And I will continue to help people dig and get passionately excited in being able to understand scripture as they've never done it before. And we could see what the Lord has done for us over these past couple months you know, month and a half, two months with this bringing us all the way back to Genesis and revealing the truth of all these creations of groups has just been incredible. And we will continue to build on that and so much more as the Lord God permits until our time comes. And I pray that we are watching and praying and and ready and diligent in the Lord, lifting each other up and doing what we need to do so that when he comes, we can be ready, we can be looking, and we won't be ashamed. We will be there saying, Lord, here I am. Come and get me. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.